And we started about 2000, about the year 2000. Okay. Yeah. And, yep. then, and then it took us about four years, three, four years before we got the good models done. But what we found out was that of all the projects that people were doing for integration, probably only 20% were succeeding. If, if, if even that many, yeah. and they were always over budget and everything else, which was really a pain. And it was because they, we weren't speaking the same language. You know, you would think that we would, but you had engineers and you had operations folks on one side, you had uh, logistics people on another side as an IT people, and they'd talk about stuff and it wouldn't have the same meaning. It wouldn't have the same, it didn't mean anything to those people. So we said, well, okay, we're going to talk with SAP. We're going to talk with Microsoft. We're going to talk with IBM. We're going to talk with all these, uh, these uh, Oracle and all the others and say, look, we're going to come up with a way to describe the information that is needed on the factory floor and the information that's needed back up to the business side of it. And that's where we started. So we had to create terms and create names because we didn't want to use one company's existing name. So we said, okay, we've got, uh, production orders, or now it's been expanded operations orders. We've got operational schedules and these sort of things, which go back and forth between the systems. Um, that gave us part two. The next piece we worked on was, and I, you probably, you, I don't think you're a fan of it, but it's part three. And part three was, how does the magic happen? How does the magic happen? We get a process or production order or production schedule coming down. I'll use that, that terminology. And then somehow stuff goes on and we open valves and we close valves and we turn on motors and we close motors. What happens in between that? So as we went through the, the committees, we are were, we were interviewing people. We're talking to people. We're saying, what's your job? How do these jobs fit together? And it's always like, well, we get the schedules down and then somebody, or maybe a, a system, but somebody takes the schedules and says, okay, how do I do that on my lines? I know what my resources are, which the top level scheduling didn't really know. I got to right. break it down. I got to come up with a, with a, with a production, with a, a work schedule of how I'm going to do that work. Um, I got to know what my resources are. And then I got to create that work schedule. And then I've got people out there who look at the schedule and say, okay, it's Tuesday, it's two o'clock time for me to start this job, execute the job, collect the data. So part three defines the magic. What we discovered was it didn't matter what kind of manufacturing facility we were looking at. Everybody was doing these same sort of things. You take the schedule, you break it up into the jobs you do, you execute the jobs, you collect the data that you wanted, you tra track that data you collected back to relate to the jobs you had to do. Uh, you, you manage the, uh, the, SOPs, the procedures, all the work, all those things. Uh, you, you manage your resources. Are my materials available? Or are my people trained? All, all these things. Um, and, and we found it, it applied with not originally. Originally, we wrote it for production only. We said, this is a production operation. You know, I'm making uh, tablets. I'm, uh, you know, make, uh, making cars. I'm making something like that. But then we found, oh, we can apply the same thing in maintenance. And we can apply the same thing in laboratories. And we and 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 other places. Um, we've had people who've done it in in shipping and dispatching. Um, there's a there, these sort of things, and we said, oh, okay, we got a standard model, but it can be applied mu uh, multiple different places. The details vary, but the structure is still there. Somebody is performing these jobs, so that's what part three was. It's the magic. It's how you take something from a business level system and actually all the way down to, like I say, open the valves, turn on the motors, do all those other things. Uh, part four was when we finished that, we said, oh, okay, now we have actually a bunch of MES vendors out there that are trying to either acquire functionality as we have defined in part three, because many of them looked at it and said, oh, I'm only doing like these parts here. I'm going to go buy companies. I'm going to put these together. And then they, uh, the, the, uh, and users were saying, oh, okay, I don't have a single monolithic system. You know, I'm not buying everything from Siemens or Rockwell or Schneider or one of these other guys. I'm, I'm piecing these together. So how do I make these things work together? So we took the same concept of creating the object models for the information that flows between the different activities in level three. So that's what part four is. So the idea then is it's detailed. It's more job orders rather than process orders. Process so orders. Production orders are you know, two comments. Yeah. 
so when you I want to go back to something you said at the very beginning when you were originally talking to people you realized the left hand never knows what the right hand does right you, you yes. and and here to to the audience this is a a perfect illustration early on in my career when I w became an architect which was about 2012 so I I I worked in I was in manufacturing for the first half of my career so I did 5 years in mining and then I did 2 years in printing and then I did three years in steel, and then I did two years in tier one automotive. Then I moved to consulting. The whole time in the beginning of my career, I was on the plant floor. So, yeah. and I, I've told this story many, many times about how my dad told me I didn't learn anything in college and I need to learn from the people on the plant floor. So go find the guy who's got 30 years of experience, keep your mouth shut and learn everything that person knows, right? And, right. and, then, and then take your brain and figure out how to abstract that into value for the business. That's what my father told me after college. And one of the things that I discovered early on was I always wanted to know how everything worked. So when I, when I became a consultant, I, I learned while I was as a manufacturer, I always learned the entire business. There's a, you know, there's the manufacturing workflow, right? We sell stuff, we plan to manufacture it, we execute the manufacturing, we supervise our plant operations, we supervise our equipment, we inventory and warehouse it, we, get, we yep. ship it, we get paid for it, we do it all over again, right? That's what every single manufacturer does. What was amazing to me was that nobody, the only, the only thing anyone knew, like if you were in business development, the only domain you knew was CRM. And if, you, yeah. if I'm in planning or I'm, or I'm in finance or I'm in human resources, the only domain I know is ERP. And if I'm in manufacturing, the only one I know is either MES, GATA, whatever. Yeah. So I would go and talk to clients and I would say, tell me how your business works on a whiteboard. And I would say, how do you sell shit? And then how do you plan it? And then, and, and walk me through the actual steps. When, what is the trigger point between the conversion of a sale of widgets to the planning of the manufacturing of those widgets, yep. including the definition of the manufacturing? And it was amazing to me how no one knew that. Nobody so, knew it. Yeah. You, you needed a room full of people. You needed a room yep. full of people to answer each of the individual questions. Right? And, yeah. And the, and, the, and the weird part about it is because this is the same pretty much no matter what manufacturing company you're in, it's like, why didn't people see these patterns before? Why didn't they do that? So I think we got together with a really smart group of people on the 95 committee. I'm not going to include myself there, but I, cause I was, I was the editor, not necessarily the author, but we sat down and we went through it and we said, Hey, this is common. Why don't we just define this and say, look, I can walk into a factory, any place, ask somebody what they're doing and understand how it fits into a framework. So I can see how their part fits into the big picture. Okay. Right. Then I can walk into a company and I can say, okay, you're doing all these things. These things happen to be done ad hoc. <laughs> you don't have any documentation. People learn how to do it because they've right. done it that way. You need to document some of these, or you're doing these things manually that maybe you ought to be doing automated. So people were using those models, the, the ones in the part three, to say, okay, where am I strong? Where am I weak? 